very much. Um, so you, you can turn it on. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, well, as he said, there, I, I tend to work in series, and I've done a number of them. He mentioned about 12. And what I'm going to show you today is about six of those. So I'm presenting them chronologically, but you won't be seeing everything. But of course, you never would see everything. Um, and I'm going to start with the first thing that we'll see up here. Um, I'm starting with, um, just wait for us to see something. Um, OK. Can everybody see that? I'm starting with this series, um, which I call Card Catalog. And um, I always feel like the story predates this, but whenever I present this story, I end up saying, oh, no, it actually goes before that, before that, before that. So in a way, there's no beginning. But this is where I'm going to begin in describing a series of works that I've done and the different projects and how one has uh, led to another. Um, when I was still a graduate student at Yale, having started there with the idea that I would do um, work that addressed my interest in anthropology and having done a project about student life. See, I'm already talking about the stuff we're not looking at, but I'll get over that. Um, I had been doing a project at Yale that was about students and student life, and I was interested in just the culture of it and my access to this undergraduate culture as a, as a sort of insider-outsider. Being a graduate student, I had access to the undergraduate culture, but I wasn't part of it, which is kind of an interesting anthropological opportunity. As I was doing that, I got interested in what was surrounding the students more than the students, the figures of the students and, and their bodies and their relationships. I got interested in the world of their learning and the, and the sort of areas around them. And I started doing a project about blackboards where I was going into classrooms and photographing classrooms, blackboards, and what was left on the blackboard in between the class. And that tapped into my interest in language and the ephemerality of the, uh, the opportunities, the ephemeral opportunities that it, photographing provide. And one day I was photo I, that's a whole series that isn't, I'm not showing you, I'm just getting to the beginning of this. So one day I was going to the classrooms, photographing the blackboards, and all the classrooms were occupied. It was on the weekend, and usually I was able to get in there and, and roam around with my view camera. But <coughs> they were all occupied, but I had my view camera, and I had my lights, and I was all ready to go, so I took it all to the library. And that's really how I started doing this series, the card catalog. I had everything with me. I had my student ID card. I went into the library. And I opened up a drawer and started photographing. And the whole thing about that kind of approach, and I'm beginning with this one, I have information, because I kind of think that encapsulates the idea of the library and the card catalog system and the referencing. The whole idea starts with the, that anything can be the subject of a photograph. And with that kind of playful attitude, you can see what you can find. And in this case, I started to explore the idea that words in a situation like this can be a kind of found text landscape. And I only just started this project when I was just graduating at Yale. So I really carried the project further with me when I got out of school, and most of the work from the card catalog series was done at libraries in New York. So there was NYU, there was Columbia, there was Jersey City and Hoboken, some of the libraries I could get to in the area. One of the things I realized when I was doing this project was that what I had conceived of and what it became were, were somewhat overlapping different things. I initially thought, well, this is a quotidian thing that we all do. We all go to the library. This is you know, something we can all recognize. But this was in 1994, 95, 96. The libraries were starting to digitize, and they were starting to deaccession their card catalogs. And so the project sort of acquired a documentary quality to it as well, which wasn't really my initial intent, but I can appreciate the value of that as well. And I think it's important to say that because in presenting this body of work and making the selections that I make when I do show this work, they're not representative of a library, particularly or a library si series <coughs> system. They're referencing the library. And the words I choose have more to do with where else it would take us about our world at large. And so, for example, in this one, I think it's, um, it's 
doing a lot of different things. There's the um, interest I have in the type and the way in which different kinds of typewriters are used at different times and they have a character to them, which again becomes something that we can appreciate in a different way now because we don't use typewriters the way we used to. And little handwritten mistakes and corrections which also denote the hand of the librarian. And then also the sort of worn quality of the um, card catalogs that had been handled. So there's a sense of many traces of people behind it. There's the trace of the person who organized the library and then there's the traces and the crumpled quality and the sort of smudgy quality of the, all the hands that had touched it. So again, going back to anthropology, the thing that interests me is that as societies we create institutions and as institutions generate this sort of incidental matter which if you view it obliquely or if you frame it differently or c give it a different context can be as revealing as the institution itself or it can take you to reference the institution but also take you somewhere else and so again that somewhere else for me is a kind of found poetry and that found poetry world that I'm interested in. <coughs> I'm also just, I find that there's a kind of um, idiosyncrasy in what could seem homogenous. If you imagine a, a library system on the one, on one level, it's a system, it's always implemented. On, the, on another actual level of the actual Im implementation, it's very individual. And so again, like I love things like I look for handwritten traces and things like that amidst the sort of industrial quality of the shelves. And this one always interests me because of the um, macro, um, micro quality, which um, Steele referenced before. The, um, the idea that there's, you know, if you look in the middle, Encyclopedia of Modern World, it's very large, and then below it, Encyclopedia of Microscopic Stains. And, and in a way, the sort of um, hubris of saying encyclopedia, so it can encompass everything, and then you see that hubris kind of compressed into this juxtaposition, which kind of undermines that idea. What was the time period in which you were making this work? The, this started in 94, the very end when I graduated, and then it went into 98. And the next series, which um, you'll see immediately following this, is, begins in that overlap time. So even in that time, libraries still had card catalogs, but even then they were really sort of beginning to not use them at all and realizing that that was taking up space and their whole argument has evolved around whether or not they should be kept at all. You can imagine where I stand on that. <laughs> and I just think there's something so, um, again, there's a tension between the, um, all the sort of emotions that you get from the handwriting and then this pres presentation, it exists in this place and it's very matter of fact. It's sort of a feeling like that a f you know, photographic process can bring to something like that you notice it. It's really about just noticing and framing. So. And then in some of them, I also had this feeling that there was um, a kind of history and, a, and also a portraiture. So I think of, I have a few like this that I think of as like biographies. Here's another biography. This, these next two, this one and the one following it, I did at Columbia, and that was a funny thing. Each library I went to had a different story as far as access. So at NYU, I wrote a letter, and I got permission for a period of time, and I had to write another letter to get a per to permission to go again for another spe specified period of time, like over, over like the year, like from, from December, say, to March, that sort of thing. And then at Columbia, because I had gone to Barnard, I had an alumni card, and I went into Columbia, and I never said a word to anyone. I had my tripod and my view camera and, and nobody said anything to me and, and they were renovating and I think they just assumed that I was part of the renovation because it was kind of brazen, you know. So and then there were other libraries where I got kicked out pretty quickly. I didn't I there were two libraries, one in New, in New Jersey at Jersey City where they were very nice about letting me in in Hoboken. They were very nice, but the person who was nice didn't really have the authority to let me in. So another day, someone else came along and kicked me out. So it's funny, like, like as a photographer, you have these questions of permission and access, and 
you know, whether or not people are comfortable with what you're doing. Okay, that's the last one for the card catalogs, and I'm going to move into the next project. And then there, there's going to be questions after, too, so if anybody has a question. Um, this project is called the Frick. And it was in 1998, and someone had suggested to me that the Frick Art Reference Library had a very nice card catalog. So I wrote a letter, I got permission. That's the kind of place where you really need very specific permission to get, even just to go in to use the library for anything. And um, I noticed that they had, not only did they have a nice card catalog, but they also had a photo archive, which is, a, again, a 20th century notion for art historians, which we don't need anymore, but which I would hope still exists. Um, they're black and white glossy photographs of paintings that are available for art historians to look at and they were um, cataloged and indexed and I started to notice that the card catalog index cards corresponding to this photo archive had wonderful notes on the back of them. So what they were, were they were um, cross-reference notes that librarians had made that were giving you the subject specifically the subjects that were in the painting it was specifying, but also subjects in general so they could be cross-referenced. So if you're an art historian and you're interested in pewter in still lives, you would know that this particular painting had it, but also it would be filed under another one as well. So it, they became like little poems. So to me, this is like a still life poem. I didn't make a point of saying the titles of the paintings that they're specifically referring to because one of the things that kind of threads through all my work is the way in which I want there to be a sense of where it's what it's referring to but I also want to free you from that and let you go somewhere else so in other words this selection of text can give you a feeling about the subject matter of art in general rather than tying you so specifically to a particular painting. And then there are a couple of cases like this one where I kind of have a feeling of what painting it is. And the reason I say that is because I didn't keep notes of that myself either. I didn't want to. I kind of, when I do this work, I like to keep a distance between the thing I'm coming from so that it frees me to go somewhere. And I'm always looking for things for me, especially things that are funny um, incidentally. So this kind of little matter-of-fact correction kind of becomes funny. I'm not sure if you can see it that well, but there are little details. This is still done with a gelatin silver um, large format view camera. Um, there's the indentations that the typewriter made on the card. And um, I'm not sure if I have uh, one of the ones here that I'm thinking of right now, but there's um, sometimes there's white out and these are all, again, things that are kind of outmoded, but that the camera can capture because they have texture. And as Steele put it so nicely, there's like just a little bit of depth. This is the circle that the rod would put, which gives you a feeling that this image is cropped. So in other words, it's not the whole index card. The whole index card is white except for that text, and I just cropped it that way. And I'm looking for things like these little check marks and the little idiosyncrasies in the, in the letters, the, the typewriting mistakes. I, I feel like it lends a lot of character to everything. I'm really, I'm just drawn to different fonts and things like that. And I'm just drawn to the way that um, mechanical things still have a kind of little personality. And you can sort of, if you kind of push for looking for that, you can find that. So here's the next one that I was talking about. That stuff at the top is white out. And it, so it has this character to it, which is, you know, an interesting thing. And again, something that a view camera can draw out because of the way that it can pick up on texture. And in this one, I really love the matter-of-factness of the checks. Like, it's, if you think about it, the subject matter of art is pretty heavy. <laughs> but then the way that they're interacting with it is so matter-of-fact. And I did a bunch of nudes. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So you can sort of try to imagine what, what could that be? <laughs> this is like a nature mort. So this was 1998. And this is a very, this Frick project is a very finite project. Most of my projects I tend to think of as being open-ended because like with the card catalogs, conceivably there are card catalogs to, to look at, around, you know, endlessly, and I could continue with that. With the Frick, it was very specific because it was tied to that particular photo archive. And the idea of that could continue elsewhere, but this was very specifically done at that photo archive. Also, I should say that, that the images that reside there are, are not confined to what's in the Frick collection. It was, it was really a library for art historians beyond what's in their collection. So that was 1998. And then I started this other project called Index, and this is an example that goes on to this day in the sense that I'm still coming across things that I could add to that if I wanted to. Um, I started looking at books in the back of books, and I was looking at indexes, and I was looking at, I, I love old fonts, and I was just looking at a very old book and appreciating the layout and the fonts, and then I thought about the fact that in the index there was this range of um, subjects that were coming up, and the fact that that contrasts with the way now things tend to be very narrow and specialized. And if you look at an academic book, you might not find such a range. And that was really what started me looking at that, thinking about the kind of um, juxtapositions that you find with those, that range. And because it was very small, I decided that I needed to enlarge it in a way that was a different process from the view camera. So this was the first time I did anything where I scanned. And what I did was I actually made lots and lots and lots and lots of Xeroxes of the indexes in books. And in doing so, I generated a lot of this sort of noise that surrounds the image. And um, essentially made two piles, a pile of the noise. So that's like enlarged weave of a hardcover book and sections of index. And again, I wasn't thinking about what book something came from because it, it's kind of like, I, I equate a lot of this to very traditional f photographic processes because you, um, you go out and you photograph and you think you have a great day and you feel great about it. But that doesn't actually necessarily mean that that day was so productive. And I find that like the distance in, in traditional photographing of photographing, developing, looking, no matter what I'm doing, I'm always kind of carrying that through. There's a distance between the moment when I may find something and then later when that actually does or doesn't turn out to be something I'm going to work with. Um, so here you see like pages, this, like those, that's, those lines are like the edge which actually kind of um, foreshadows later work. Um, so I think that also this was interesting to me because of the way it related to the card catalogs, that sort of indexical quality, which um, you could say is a mark of photography as well, the sort of index of something. Um, you feel like, OK, this is a relationship to a book. We know this came from a book. It's always important to me that this work, that the words are as I found them. They're isolated, but they are existing in this order. And yet, rather than tie you down to that particular book, it also kind of becomes its own poem. They're also, I'm um, not really sure if these are reproduced right exactly the way I'm going to describe it, but they're a very, very, very dark blue. When I did this, I thought it was interesting, the idea that since I was going to be doing this, um, digitally to some degree, I could actually change the color. And so I made it a very, very dark blue. But it was so early on for me in using a computer or anything that I didn't save the blue. And now, I mean, the idea of this is ridiculous because it's, it's nothing. You can just sample the color and have it. But I didn't know that, really. I don't know. So anyway, each one of these is a different blue. So you don't really notice it. And actually, I, when I reproduce them, sometimes I just make them black. Um, because the files are really large. Again, something that technically I have more fluidity with now. But anyway, um, if you see them all in a row in an exhibit, you'll actually see like some are darker blue, some are, you know, you can see the blues. But it's, I just think it's sort of an interesting quality. And it's also kind of interesting as far as like how um, different technologies suggest different possibilities. And like the card catalogs, there's a few of them that are sort of like biographies to me.
<laughs> it's hard to understand why that word would just be <laughs> something you'd go and look up that way. But This one is interesting. It was um, up in a gallery in Chelsea on September 11th. And it wasn't in a part of a show. They just had it in their office. And it was just strange in a way because it was they kept it up for a while after that. And it sort of, you know, that, I did this project around that time. So it kind of remind, whenever I see this one, it kind of reminds me of that. So this project, when it started in um, like 99, 2000, went to like 2001, I think, 2002, 2003. I did, a, I did some beyond that. I did a, a body of them in French. So it didn't end then. And again, in a way, like I said, I don't really um, finish these things because I still come across books sometimes where I think, oh, I love that index. And I have like at home, I have piles of books that are are like potentially useful for different things and so like I have one sometimes that I save because I like their indexes. And then now I'm going to jump way ahead. So that's like mid 2000s at the very latest. And this is um, the Naked Eyes project which I started in 2008. And um, I, it was really nice. I got a grant from New York Foundation for the Arts in 2008. and. Um, that was just very, you know, it's always very encouraging when you get a grant like that. And um, I used it to buy a new camera and to buy other equipment. And anyway, um, I, um, in this project also, it's very important just right off the bat to start out saying that they're not collages. They're really about a very deadpan, straight approach to photographing something and showing how just that approach can give you something else. So that's what intrigues me about it. I love collage. It's, I don't have a problem with collage. It's just that it's, it's essential in this pr body of work that, that, that it be understood. Um, so what I'm doing is I, I had done another project because I'm obviously I skipped way ahead. This is 2008. I did a project um, about UFOs and I was looking at a lot of um, mass market paperback books from the 60s and 70s about UFOs and they were very kind of um, shrill and crazy and I just started noticing the qualities of the books as well and, and they would have still images inside and they had these beautiful dyed edges and just the books themselves were sort of intriguing artifacts and again going back to anthropology thinking about um, objects as artifacts and thinking in terms of what they can say about a time and those paperbacks really felt like they were sh you know very shrill they were really saying a lot and um, so I started opening them up and, and it, just photographing them, exploring them. And I, I realized that if you open up the book a certain way and photograph it at a certain angle, you get this sort of oblique experience of the book, which takes you somewhere else. And so a lot of these um, books are um, from the 60s and 70s, not entirely. They're like ranges from the 50s all the way to the 80s, 90s. But the bulk of them are the 60s, 70s. Again, it's like I, I've come to realize I'm, I'm a 20th century person. A lot of the stuff I do seems to be kind of tied to that. It's not exactly nostalgia, but it reflects my time and period of coming of age. But also I think that I'm always looking for texture and things. And the more digital everything becomes, the less there is. And it doesn't mean that you can't find things in the digital world. It's just what I'm drawn to. I'm drawn to texture and I'm drawn to things and artifacts. So um, this one actually, this is, um, can anybody recognize who this is? Yeah, so it's called art. <laughs> and um, it's kind of a unique one for me, which is one of the reasons why I don't feel like this project is finished, in that I'm, the angle shows the top of the book as well, which is really something I haven't done very much. But that kind of reminds me that there's more to do. Um, a lot of the books come from what they call movie tie-ins, where they're old books about a movie, where they have stills from the movie. and. The funny thing about this is that um, in some of the books I work with for my art, I, they're books from my own library or books that I've read. Or, in this series, they're not really, I'm not like a fan person. They're not particularly, 
not really inter not really <laughs> these people like like the way that you would be if you were collecting everything about Goldie Hawn or whatever. But um, I'm interested though in the in the way the books look and what the books can do. So this is Goldie Hawn in the movie Shampoo. Also in this project, um, I am more aware of the books I'm, that I'm sourcing. Um, because I live with the books for a long, long time, and they're not books just at a library that I'm visiting. And um, it, the titles of the images don't always reflect where they came from, but I am much more conscious of it in this project. This one is called Jaws. It's from, it's the mayor from the movie Jaws. These are the kind of things that I don't necessarily say, but. If, if I'm talking about it, I might say. Um, this is Nixon and Pat. So political biographies are also interesting to me. And are you, are you still shooting with the view camera? No, no, no. Um, after, I mean, I have done other projects um, because I, I didn't include everything. I've done other projects with the view camera, mm -hmm. and I still have a dark room, but this stuff is digital. And the thing about, I actually started this project initially with a view camera in black and white, and, um, which is funny actually to be talking about with this particular image because this is not one of those. But um, I just really appreciate the fact that with the digital camera I can take so many images because in this project the angle really changes what the picture is. And I just take many, many pictures and then decide which one I want. But you're not bothering any of you. No, no. I mean, the idea is I'm just opening up the book, and it's, it's me moving. So it's the angle I'm taking it at is what makes the picture. <laughs> Can anyone guess who this is? It's just funny sometimes. This is Sonny from Sonny and Cher. It's a biography about Cher. <laughs> so that, that, that's Cher's arm. <laughs> and a lot of them, I think, have a very kind of um, suggest a cinematic narrative, partly because they come from Cin cinema stills, but also because of the way in which it's broken up, which kind of suggests like a film sequence of, you know, the little images in a row. Uh, I may have missed this, but you had said that you had lived with these books. For, are these your books? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not, they, they weren't initially my books. They're now my books. Like, I go and find them. Like, I go to used bookstores and collect them and stuff. And so what I'll do with these photographs is, um, Sometimes I stay, I, I go back to a book over and over again. So, like sometimes I'll think there's definitely something in here, but I haven't found it yet, and I'll try again and again. So, like a, a year could go by, and I go back to the book and try it again. So, by then, I, like I really know these books. And this one, the um, book was wet, so the pages were warped. And you know, to me, the thing is that like you, you know, the the point is that that was really, a, you know, a, a straight photograph, and that's just exciting to me because it has this kind of like, I call this one amnesia and it's about soap opera. It's from a book about soap operas and so the idea is like, you know, the, in the TV show or something where they have that kind of like, oh, and he woke up. And so. This was one of the first books I looked at, but it wasn't until much, much, much later that I got this picture. So it's um, one of the things that I really enjoy about this project is the feeling of, uh, that I can keep working with this material. And wasn't that just like an um, exercise yeah, or something? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a book about exercising. So she's on different pages in that position.
And again, I mean, I wouldn't rule out working with books now. It's just that they don't produce books like this now. I mean, the, the pages are acid free, so they tend to be have shiny and, and don't reproduce as nicely. And also the colored edges. I think there's a little bit of a comeback with the colored edges in hardcovers, because sometimes I see hardcovers printed that way. But it's not that same kind of like throwaway mass market thing that you used to buy at the supermarket. OK, this is the last one from this series. And um, I don't know. If, I mean, if there's any questions, we can have, we'll have time for questions. But now I'm going to move into the next project, which more or less happened around the same time. I started doing the naked eye work in 2008. And then in 2009, I developed this next project, Dog Ear. And I was invited to make a book. And so I spent a lot of time working on that. And I hadn't finished The Naked Eye by a long shot. And I felt like I wanted to get back to it, which is one of the reasons why The Naked Eye project stretches over a longer time. Because I started doing this one. And in a way, ended up going back and forth between the two, because both of them were really compelling for me to continue. Um, so in this project, which I call Dog Ear, it comes out of an, the same kind of anthropological idea that I'm looking at what actions, institutions, what things that people do. So just in the same way that um, the card catalog reflects a hand pulling a drawer or handling a card, this is reflects an action which many people, including me, do, which is when you're saving your place in a book and you fold it over. And it coincided with a time when my son was younger, when he was learning how to read, and he would fold the page really formally because it was like a new thing, the idea of doing it. And, so that kind of came together for me as a formal way to do this. And I had this idea for a long time to consider the juxtaposition that exists when you fold a corner, when you dog ear. And so it's not meant to be, it's not found in the sense that I don't look at a book and see how someone else dog eared it. I make the dog ears. But it reflects the action of something that people do. And in this work, it's very important to me that it works as a poem as well as a visual field. So there's all kinds of things I'm sort of considering. I'm considering the type and the font, and I'm considering how it's read. And they're meant to work for me. They have to, when I'm making them, I'm reading them to myself. And they have to read in all the possible ways. So like I'll read it this way, this way, that way, that way. Or I'll read it this way, this way, this way, this way. And um, here, I'll read this next one. Because I've done some performances where I read these. And um, so I'll just give you an example. So, yes, yes, I was mad. The doll, our care, the couch, in his final with a leaping thou, the, me, sudden. <laughs> and then also, like, what I'll do sometimes is make up, like, in my mind, I kind of think, oh, that works. And I sort of jump from part of a word into a whole word. And I invited a friend of mine who's a poet to read them a couple on a couple of occasions and she actually made up sounds for the the little juxtapositions in the middle at the crease so there's a lot of fun found sound poetry possibilities in them and this is in a show at the met right now this piece it's called everyday epiphanies it's a photo show I'm not going to talk that much, because then you can just read them. So I was lucky when I started this project because um, 
a lot of these ideas are just kind of done on faith, like the idea that I'm going to find something. And in this project, there's a lot of failure. I'll go through books and, and not, for the most part, not find anything that I think is very interesting. But um, I was lucky that I started with my own books and found a few right away that were enough to make me think there was something more to look for. Um, they don't, um, I think also as I continue with the project, because I have done a few more recently as well, um, I'm harder and harder on myself. So in a way, the failure rate increases. Like initially, more could be of interest. But then at this point, if I'm adding to this, I wouldn't want to be redundant. And another unfortunate thing is that um, all these projects, the, the actual subject matter, the actual artifact, starts to become more and more obsolete. So in doing this again, I pictured all these used bookstores and all these places to find old books. And that's less and less the case, at least in New York. I think that there are other places where there's still more bookstores. So I'll read this one aloud just to give you a feeling how I read it. Your sister is not to wear stockings gravely. And then the earth was stairs, and I up starry, uninteresting, not even wheel king set. Um, actually, this is a good example of something I like. read it lots of different ways. Um, yes. Yes. How? Differently. I would not do that. Actually, I don't think I've ever read it that way. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, one of the best things is when they can work any way at all. And it's interesting because when I, I've done readings of these now, but initially when I was first invited to do it, I um, invited my friend to do it. and. Um, she didn't read it. Like, I would always say, oh, yeah, you can read it any way you want. And then I, she didn't read it the way I read it. And then I realized, oh, I do, for the most part, have a way that I read them. But I do feel conceptually that the idea is that it can be read any way, and it should have a certain you know, work somehow. But this next one I'll read, because I, I like the way this one. Bear looked around, said, now would schnapps delight? Then the polar bear began pawing the story, the schnapps, the birds, suddenly do dinner? Sure. And now I have just a little bit from the most recent project, which um, is on newspaper clippings. And it's, while it's so important for me to say that the other projects are not collage, this one could arguably call, be called collage. It's, although on the other hand, it's still, I'm working with found text. I'm just working with, um, it's kind of actually more similar to the index project, because what I'm doing is I'm collecting lots and lots and lots of little snippets of text from the newspaper. And I'm also collecting all the other little bits of stuff that come up as like printing errors or little bits of ads and color in the, in the um, newspaper. So like that line where there's a bit of red with the text, that's like a printing error where it's smeared onto the next page, that kind of thing. And I'm putting that together. So it looks a lot like the naked eye in the sense that it's like layers or like the card catalog in, in the sense that it's these layers, but it is assembled the way that the index is. So it kind of connects to all of those projects, I think, because the index is the one that it connects to the most in terms of how it's um, assembled. But then visually, I think it kind of looks like the card catalog. And then the fact that its color connects a bit more to the naked eye. And they're very, very small. And they're very hard to manipulate because they're so small. And when I do them and look at them, and then I think, oh, I'd like to just move that. I can't really change it once I've done it, because they just fall apart. Mm -hmm. 
So some of these are in um, the show that I have in um, Paris right now, and some of them are going into the show that I'm doing in Berlin, in, in addition to naked eye pieces as well. That's the last one. That's okay. Installation pictures, though, no posters and stuff. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, that's okay. Next time. <laughs> so, do you have questions? Mm -hmm. uh, this may have a little bit less to do with the current work, but with, for example, the card catalog work. How much time did you spend speaking with the people who actually professionally dealt with the card catalogs? Because obviously their relationship to those objects is completely different from yours. And how did you see that interaction influence the work or the ideas, the concepts? Well, I, I didn't, for the most part, my interaction with the professionals in the library was more about access and less sure. about the project specifically or about the libraries. But um, a sort of autobiographical detail which comes up in the Art in America article is that my mother studied library science so um, I think that the whole concept of library science was something she went back to graduate school when I was a teenager. So I think that I sort of had in the back of my head that idea of that from watching her, I mean, I was still living at home and watching her go to school and learn, and learn those things. Right, because you had mentioned how nonchalantly it seemed that people were checking off these things that seemed so absurdly paired, but to them it was just like a- It's work. Thing. It's yeah, work. yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think the thing that interests me is that, that um, you know, that function that you're carrying out and that leaves traces that someone else can come along and see something else altogether in. So I, I worked when I was a teenager. Um, I worked at different libraries filing things and, you know, stuff like that. And just, in a way, I think it also comes out of boredom. It's like you're doing something really mundane and you're just looking for something to p be playful about, you right. know, in, in something that doesn't seem like there's anything playful there. So, any other questions? How do you usually install your images and, and how are they like framed and how big are they and do you usually like make a groups or show them together, different works or? Yeah, that's a good question and it brings, but I should have, I could have shown some installation shots. Um, it depends. Um, I've, for example, with the um, car catalogs or the index, well actually I'll say the index, so that's what sprung to mind. Um, I had a show of those. Um, where there were many, so you walked in and it was like many, 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 maybe too many. Um, and then other times there have been very sparse, um, one, a lot of space, another, and they're framed. Um, then um, more recently I've been doing um, installations where um, some of the work are, are presented almost like a poster, and then on top of that is something framed. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of open to different things. That when I was in the Sao Paulo Biennial, they, um, presented 10 different projects of my work, so it was like 100 pieces, it was really huge. And in um, one instance with the space, we decided to put things in a vitrine, so it was flat and it was unframed. So um, we discussed which project that would work that way. And um, I didn't think the card catalogs would work as well that way, but we chose a different project for that. So I'm, I'm open to different things, but um, for the most part they tend to be discrete units that are framed. And they're not that big. They're like, most things are no bigger than 20 by 24 for the most part. I mean, for printing myself, I don't really like to print bigger than 20 by 24 myself. I just find it difficult. So I have done work that's bigger than that, but I've had a lab do it. Hmm. Yeah. I was just wondering how the medium is important to you. Like, uh, your initial work was done by 4 by 5 and yeah. Does you know, each medium ask like, you know, you to value on your work or just as tools? Well, they're, they're important. I think in a way it's like the, sometimes it's the subject 
that kind of dictated the need for a particular approach. And in other cases, at this point, I think I do feel very comfortable with the digital process. So um, it's, um, there are things you lose if you don't use a view camera. Like there's its quality and texture and archival, you know, I mean, it's just typical of where we're going with a lot of um, technology that you sort of lose, a, there's a lot, all this amazing stuff that's available, but less co uh, commercially viable, so less available, that's actually great. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not really, um, I kind of want to have all the tools as an option. I don't, it makes me a little nervous, like you go to the photo store and think, oh my God, are they not selling that film anymore? You know, it's, it's scary, it's like a scary time, because we can't, as artists, we can't um, keep the market up. So if it doesn't have a commercial, you know, viability then it's it could go so yeah I got the same kind of question so I was just wondering to switch from black and white to color and try to come to the choice um like yeah I mean it's interesting um I think it really just came out of feeling like I needed to shake things up a little bit like I, it, when I did do the naked eye project I had started it with black and white, but it just didn't feel like the right way to go about exploring that. So, it, and using the digital camera and opened up the idea of color, because then it would have been a more like um, conscious choice to take the color away. Whereas with the black and white, I was so used to using my. Yeah, exactly. So the subject matter made, it made sense anyway. Um, yeah. It's interesting because I did another project which you didn't see here, piano rolls, and that's the one where I always feel a little bit like it's it's hard to. Um, it felt very much like a conscious decision not to do color, even though the piano rolls they come they're from player pianos and they're these wound up rolled things and they have beautiful, they're beautiful things like they're they're beautiful paper, but when I reproduced them, I kind of wanted to go the direction of the index and make them very graphic and stark to kind of emphasize the mechanical cold quality in a way to kind of have that be a tension with the sentimentality of the lyrics I was collecting. But um, it's, you know, it's always something I'm more and more conscious of it now in a way because like I can actually get rid of the color in digital and make it black and white. You know? Well, I really love Basho and the, the narrow road to the deep north. And I remember in um, graduate school, we had to do this. Um, we had this assignment where we all had to think of like a travel narrative or, or travel. Well, we, we all saw the movie Sherman's March, which is really, really funny. And, it, you know, the idea of like the journey and what happens on the journey. And so I talked about Basho. And, and that's a nice kind of photographic idea because the idea is that you're taking a journey and you're writing a poem that commemorates a place and a spot and that's something very photographic so but I really just like studied I love studying Japanese and I love Japanese literature and in college I took this great course on um, Japanese cinema and film and literature and, and it was just so it was a great teacher and it was a great subject so I think all those things influenced me I mean, actually, I have, I have a question, um, which has to do, um, let's see, I guess I have two questions. One, the first question really has to do with the, I mean, so much of this work is, is text. It's, you know, things that we read or even, and in a way that the, even the image aspect of them, like in the naked eyes, we're still kind of leaping from these pictures into something that we imagine mm -hmm. and which is sort of the way you do with reading yeah works. yeah so that in a funny way I mean you're making pictures but they uh, I mean often we sort of expect that the picture that we're looking at is about what it's of yeah and in a sense these are pictures that are about it's not like what so they are well, it's just kind of you know they lead you right into the imagination. Yes, it's, it's about what you it's about what you conjure. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. so much like reading, and I wonder sort of how you think about that. Yeah, I, lo I love the way you're thinking about that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just something so fascinating to me about reading in general about the fact, like like for example, 
I definitely weigh down on the side of books and not Kindles. I read books and I don't actually ever read kin with a Kindle or anything like that. But there's something about that aspect of reading that intrigues me, the fact that it has this sort of um, incorporeal quality. So I don't know, I th I've, I'm really intrigued by that. It's, it's got a physicality, but in a way there's this absence that it leaves something to happen that's not concrete. Right, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's like as we read, I mean, even when we read a novel, right, that's a story, where there's so much of what we're actually experiencing, we've projected into it. Yeah. Right? Or we've embellished it with. And, I mean, Personalized I think, it, yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that's so much, I mean, I don't know that it's as true, say, of painting or sculpture as it is of photography, that with photographs, again, so much of their content is not in the image, like if you think of, I don't know, family snapshots, for instance, I mean, they're fairly banal things, and you look at, you know, one's own snapshots are so much more resonant, or of one's own family, because you, so that so much of what we get out of images right. is this other stuff that happens in the image, or from the imaginary. Right, right. And your work seems in particular to sort of encapsulate that, or almost to be, I don't know whether it's directly about that or sort of incidentally about and way about Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that um, I've talked about absence and presence a lot. So like in terms of that sort of indexical question that, that you know, there's, it's referring to something that isn't there, but it's also taking you to something that isn't there because the thing that isn't there is also what you imagine and that's mm -hmm. not there either. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of absence in the, in the present mm -hmm. thing. So. That's a question I've thought about a lot, but I, but I think the way you're putting it is really interesting. And, and it's, it's, if you think about portraiture and photography, it's also one of those funny things because a portrait of a famous person, we bring to it what we know about that famous person. So what does it mean to make a portrait of a famous person? And a portrait of someone you know, of course, it's all about you knowing that person. So it's really interesting. Another question too, but maybe does anybody other other folks have questions? I'm not trying to shut you off. Um, I mean, the, the other question really has to do with um, it's like so much of the work has makes me think. It's always made me think of like Don DeLillo or this kind mm -hmm. of oh, kind of this noirishness. Maybe not so much with. Uh, um, dog ears exactly which are kind of more I don't know poetico or something like that but the the card catalogs there's this kind of I don't know s almost sort of sinister or like I'm not necessarily sinister but there's sort of this big big realm that they deal in you know God and reality and something existential and then the the, um, the uh, I don't know the naked eyes have this kind of film noir quality, and they and the last, the public imaginations also, yeah, you know, make me think. I think of Delillo and like you know the Delillo of White Noise or something like that, where, and you know, so that there's a kind of um, darkness that threads through a lot of the work. And as I've gotten to know you, I know like you don't strike me as being dark at <laughs> all. You know, you have this kind of light, sort of sense of humor and intelligence about stuff. And I'm sort of wondering like. Is this a, is your work a place for these other well, I think, visions of the world to come out? Or? I think it's I think it's like a um, it's a thread running through it because it's like a commentary about I, I'm sort of saying 20th century because I've kind of gotten comfortable with accepting the idea that most of the material is 20th century. But there, I, I like the idea that through all the different projects, there's certain themes that come you come back to. So like. Um, Maybe I'm going to mention ones that you haven't seen, but like, uh, well, actually, okay, suburban home subversive activities. There's a certain kind of feeling of um, I'm playing around with the pop culture references of paranoia and fear and things that came up in those times. So like, I had one card catalog that says radioactive fallout, you know, which isn't necessarily in the past as an issue, but it, it there was a time when and and it when those card catalogs were created was closer to that time when that was a big popular fear. And the, the projects that I'm doing right now in Paris and in, in Germany, 
Uh, it comes out of a book I did called Sightings, and the project's called The Public Imagination. I'm kind of trying to like reference public um, preoccupations and public concerns, but it's humorous. It's, it's dark, but it's sort of dark humor, which is why I think that when, like how I actually am is more on the humor side, but, mm -hmm. the, but I think that as far as the commentary part, it's the dark things because those are the dark things people are preoccupied with and I'm, you know, I'm concerned too, I'm concerned about all the things that are, you know. Um, it's, um, it's not necessarily a dark dystopian, you know. Yeah, it's not, it's not a prediction in any way, it's more about the predictors and, or about the people who cry, the sky's falling sort of feeling. Um, it, and it's meant to be about, these, these are the things that, um, you know, it's like a mirror image to our, our society, but it, it's a sort of, you know, a subjective mirror. So the subjectivity is, is looking for those things. What about framing? I mean, the, it, this, it's curious to what an extent your work is really, it's sort of classic photography. I mean, even in the cases where you're assembling things and then taking photographs of them, um, it's, um, you know, it's not heavily, man, you know, kind of heavily manipulated, even in the, even in the sort of the Gursky-ish right. way. It's not, it's not, the photograph isn't really collage, except it, I guess maybe with the indexes to some extent. Um, and it really seems to be about framing, you know, what's, you know, choosing something, identifying something, and then and framing as a way of also putting, leaving things out, framing out. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, can you talk about that a little bit, just sort of framing and its relationship to photography in general? And, and yeah. I mean, in, in photography in general, what interests me is the idea that there are things there and you just have to find them. And that, and that just has always been the, the approach that most interests me. We talked a lot of, at Yale about truth and how there's no truth and it's okay if you manipulate and if you stage something and that's fine. And so it's not a matter of, of a pr on principle. It just has to do with what interests me, that, that it interests me, the idea that it's found. So I... It's like finding your voice in what's already there. It's hard to explain, but that's kind of like the way that the words excite me, that, I, that they're somehow my voice, but they're not because I found them. But it's the fact that I have those things to, to look from and find that interests me. And then, and then the framing is it's all about the context. So it's giving you enough of the thing to know that it comes from this specific thing and it's very specific because it isn't manipulated but at the same time clearing it away so that you're freer from it so there's kind of like a fine line between how much do I give and how much do I take away um, it's it's you know I'm, I can appreciate different approaches to photography and ones where things are, are like like for example I do love collage I actually used to do collage and that was one of the, I used to paint and I did collage and one of the reasons I thought I might in, get more engaged with photography was that it could be material for collage. So I'm, there's no principle that, that guides me against that. It's just that I feel intrigued and it's very tough. It's really, it's really challenging to allow that constraint. It's like a constraint that says, okay, these, this is the way that you have to, um, it limits what I can do because I'm sort of saying, well, but I can't just make that go over here. I have to find something where it goes over there. So it, it's another one of those operations where you give yourself constraints in order to free yourself. So. Mm -hmm. so, anybody else have questions? Yeah, no? Oh, sure. Um, what do you think uh, about using text now? I mean, in the library, we are now using, everybody using Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm open to everything. It, it's just more a matter of what is interesting to me. So I, I feel sad that libraries don't want to, ha I mean, it's actually, it's interesting because um, 
in the librarian community itself, they're more interested in information technology. So they want anything that will give people access to information. They're not really so into this, the artifacts and the furniture. And there's a whole kind of, um, you know, push to, to have, because they say, well, you know, that area that's being taken up by the card catalogs, we could have tables and monitors and people could, you know. So um, I, it, it goes, it's the same, it's an analog with the film and photography materials. It's like, I don't really want to weigh one or the other. I wish we could have them all, but I know I can see where it's headed. And that makes me feel like I end up on the side of, of um, you know, documenting the obsolete, but it's not really about that. It's just, that's where we're headed, so. Do you think that you could ever find yourself photographing or working with images that you find, or text that you find on the internet? Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, Ken, Kenneth Goldsmith, who I've done a lot of work with, did this show um, in Mexico City at a gallery called Labor called Printing Out the Internet. And he asked me if I would do something for it, and, and initially I was like, well, how much time do I have? And it wasn't much time, and I was like, um, and he's like, don't worry about it. And then at the last minute I gave him a little something for it, but um, it's not, I don't, I haven't found a way that that makes sense for me, but I'm not against it, no. I mean, it seems so much that, uh, you know, it's, it, it's never been as though you were searching, you were, your work was being aimed at conserving. Right something that was going out of, out of fashion or style or I mean you know you think of like Ache photographs of Paris I mean I think I think he did have a, a sense that Paris was changing and you know this stuff needed to be recorded before it disappeared you've sort of been just kind of going and photographing what's here and the world has been right changing out from under you right so, exactly exactly but it's it's so interesting that you have that split between uh, as you say, your own kind of preoccupation and then the reads that come in as the work gets made. Yeah. To what extent do you get to control how your work, right. what it means? Well, I, I just, I've just come to accept that dimension, which was not part of the intention, but I can mm -hmm. understand why it has that dimension to it now. Okay, this is like going, going, gone. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Erica. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.